Hello, yes, it's Joe here for Joyrider TV, back with some more Q&A. This is all a pre-recorded session, so you won't be able to do any live chat questions, but any questions you do put in the comment section, I will get back to you and respond to those questions shortly. So let's kick it off. So all of the questions I've got here are pre-loaded. The first one is coming from Rainer, who says, do you attach yourself to the boat so that you can easily get back to your boat after a man overboard or a capsize? So what he's talking about is having a line that's permanently attached to you somewhere, like maybe on your harness or your buoyancy aid. So if you do fall in the boat, you can just reel yourself back in and get back on the boat. The short answer is no. I'm not a fan of being permanently attached to the boat. I can see, I can exactly see why it is a concern because if you do fall in the boat, like maybe if you fall off the trapeze, maybe your trapeze line breaks or perhaps you go out on the trapeze and you're not hooked in correctly and you fall in the water, boat sails off. This is quite a major issue. But what I would prefer to do than to be permanently attached to the boat is I make sure that I'm always holding the main sheet pretty tightly. So if anything did happen and I fell off the boat, I'd still be holding on to the main sheet, quickly realize, oh my goodness, I'm in the water, boat is sailing away from me, grab the main sheet with both hands. And then what will happen there by holding on to the main sheet is if the wind is lighter, you're sheeting in the mainsail by holding the main sheet. That's actually going to bring the boat up into the wind, which is going to help it to stop. And then if the wind is actually stronger, you're holding on to the main sheet is possibly even going to make the boat capsize, which is going to make the boat even easier to get back to. And then you can go through writing the capsize when you get back. Probably if you're on your own, good idea to have a bag on the boat with you. If it is a 16 or bigger, that is going to help. Yeah, so the reason I'm not in to having a permanently attached safety line is because the likelihood of getting tangled up in that line is significant. Like just when you're sailing normally, moving around the boat, you could very easily get tangled in that line. And then if you did capsize, that line could get wrapped around your hand, your feet, anywhere else, and could be another potential cause of getting stuck somewhere on the boat. So for that reason, I'm not into the permanent line. Thanks very much, Rainer, for your question. I hope that was a satisfactory answer. So just moving on, Oh, Rainer's got another sub question. What will a cat do if left on its own? Will it turn into the wind or will it sail off? So if the boat is left on its own with the sails up, it really does greatly depend on where you have the sails sheeted, what it will do. Like we've talked about in the past, the mainsail is gonna pull the boat up into the wind the jib is going to pull it away from the wind. So if you have your traveller for your mainsail in maybe halfway, maybe a bit more in from the centre, then even with the main sheet fairly loose, the boat is naturally going to steer up into the wind. Whereas if you have your traveller all the way out and any jib on at all, the boat is likely just to start sailing and you can actually have the boat sailing uh, indefinitely, just going on forever with nobody on it if you've got the sails set perfectly. So with the main out jib in, the boat will just keep going until it hits something. So don't let the traveller out all the way um, if you're leaving the boat unattended there. There we go. All right, next question is from Attila. Who asks, what do you think about wings? 
how do they affect the boat's movement and stability, especially on the Hobie 18? Yeah, the, the wings that you can fit to a catamaran, they really make the boat from what it is into something much, much bigger. So um, I think they're absolutely excellent. They give you that much more capacity. Great for cruising, sailing long distances, or perhaps if you maybe don't have so much mobility, maybe you've got some sort of injury that prevents you from helming on the trapeze, having the wings on your boat is really going to make it so that you don't need to trapeze because you're going to have that writing effort by sitting on the wing that you would normally have on the trapeze. So it's great for that purpose as well. Um, those would be the positive points of the wings. They do make the boat so much more comfortable as well. On the other hand, the negative points of the wings is they add a considerable amount of weight to the boat. I don't actually know what the weight is of a set of Magnum wings, but I would guess it would have to be about 20 to 30 kilos, which is a significant amount of weight to add to the boat. They also add a fair amount of windage as well, especially on the upwind point of sail. So it's like you've got more boat that you're trying to force through the wind. So it is going to slow you down a bit on the upwind point of sail. But on the other hand, when you're trapezing on the helm from the wing of a Hobie 18 Magnum, that is a fantastic feeling. So yes, I am definitely sitting on the fence when it comes to the wings. But if I was going for all out speed in a race, I wouldn't have the wings because of the windage and the extra weight. Thanks very much for your question, Attila. Next, we have Brett, who says, do you know of any navigation light options for beach cats in case one ends up out for longer than anticipated? Now, I'm pretty sure there's nothing on the market at the moment which is a, a specific light system for dinghies or small catamarans. I don't think anything actually is out there at the moment. I would say what would be a good idea would just off the top of my head is put something on your head like um, a head torch. That would be a very practical solution because it would help you to see where you're going and it would inform other water users of where you are. And it, yeah, I think that would be a very, very practical solution. They're very compact. I'm sure that there are many waterproof ones available. I bet if you headed over to gearreport.com, um, there will be some reviews of head torches over there. And um, I think that would be a very good, sensible option. Very compact, very practical. So that would be my number one choice there, rather than an actual navigation light for the boat which might involve having to carry a battery on the boat as well. Um, if you didn't know that you were gonna need it, I'd say that would be a very cumbersome solution for that problem. Okay, next we've got a question from Crest24, who says, I've got a question about diamond wires. On my Prindle 18.2, there was a spacer that would slide up and down each of the diamond wires. I somehow broke one the other day and I'm wondering if I should go and find one. And what is the purpose of these spacers? Just having a look. Yes, I can see one. All right, we're going on the move to take a look at what these things are. So we can see up the mast here, those are the, the spreaders and just above the spreaders we've got a plastic roller. That is what Crest24 is calling the spacer. So what those plastic rollers are for is so if your spreaders catch on the jib or the spinnaker 
it's so that the sail just kind of rolls off the diamond wire and doesn't get caught. If you don't have those there, there is a possibility that the sail, like your jib or your spinnaker, could get snagged on the spreader, which would be a bit of an issue. It could be a bit of an issue. So, yes, it is worth seeing if you can source another one. You can get ones which are slotted, so they just slot on and they have some sort of little pin that keeps them in position. But yes, well worth having, well worth having a look at. Unless on your Prindle 18 too, when the mast rotates, there's absolutely no chance of it touching the jib and you're not sailing with a spinnaker, in which case it's not such an issue. But the other point that it might actually do is when the mast is rotated a lot, that spreader could actually push in to the mainsail and that little roller is gonna stop that from being such an issue. So definitely see if you can find one and fit that. Good plan, great question, thanks. All right. So next question is from Hein. Hi Hein. Um, he says, I understand you need a lot of adjusting at wild wind. Oh, this is a follow on from the trapeze adjuster video. So he says, what is the purpose of putting the dog bone on the trapeze adjuster when you have so much adjustment already? All right, so I'm just going to look at one now. So this is what Hein is talking about. We have got our trapeze adjuster, but then at the bottom here, we've got a dog bone. The reason we have these dog bones is because for some people um, who aren't as confident on the trapeze, they want to have it as short as possible. So this might be their comfortable maximum length, which actually means if they're having it here, they've got no adjustment at all. So the reason we have the dog bone there is so that we can move it up the rope here, meaning you're gonna gain a bit of adjustment if you prefer sailing with a shorter trapeze wire. There is a lot of adjustment there, but most of it goes longer than that what less experienced sailors would be keen on. So that is the reason why we are using that. If it was on your own boat or on my Tornado, for example, I'd just have a ball there instead because I know exactly how long I want the minimum trapeze length to be. Uh, and there's never going to be any need to adjust it. So there we go. Thanks for the question, Hein. If you didn't see it, yes, I did make a video uh, this week on setting up the adjustable trapeze system. So well worth a look at that. Hope you're enjoying this new format, by the way. All right. So next question. is from Wolf. Okay, Wolf asks, what do you prefer, what would you prefer for quick and easy sailing? And the options that he's got on here, Wolf is obviously quite an experienced sailor given the options that he's presented. One is the UFO. Uh, the next one is the Wasp. The Wasp is actually a monohull which is a foiling monohull, uh, very similar to the International Moth. Um, and then he's, as option number three, a small catamaran that you can sail single-handed, which perhaps has a Jenica and a mainsail. So what would I prefer as an option for quick and easy sailing? Well, let's firstly rule something out. In at number two is the Wasp. 
that would be the option to go for if you specifically wanted to sail a foiling monohull. So um, if you're not used to sailing monohulls, then to go for a foiling monohull is not going to be a particularly easy option. You'll spend a fair amount of time capsized. Those bad boys, as far as foiling monohulls go, are reasonably stable. I know a lot more stable than the moth, but compared to the UFO, for example, it's going to be a lot less stable, so not as easy an option. But a really fun boat from what I've heard, very quick and a, a good boat to learn foiling on. But if you want the easy option, I would say for foiling, the UFO is going to be a much better option, much more stable and it really looks like a great boat, a great package, very easy foiling, easy speed, very nice. So the UFO compared to a small catamaran, he's given a price range of 10 to 15, I think that must be thousand euros. So for that money, you could get a foiling Viper F16. That's going to be the choice, I think. If it was me, I would go for the Foiling Viper every time because that is an absolute rude boy. Very quick. It will get foiling in very light winds. Um, and if the foiling is getting a little bit too um, exciting for you, you can always put in normal dagger boards and have it as a regular F-16 catamaran. You, it was so versatile, um, the Viper in its foiling or non-foiling, you could say that single-handed with two people, really, really versatile, a very well-made boat. But where the UFO would beat the Viper is on how compact it is and the ease at which you can maneuver it in the boat park, storage, all that kind of thing. So that is what I think on that topic. But thanks very much for the question there, Wolf. Um, yeah, it was, it's an interesting question, one that hasn't been posed before, but I'm very keen on that foiling Viper. Okay, so just have two more questions, which were from the live chat on Friday. The first one is from Fernando who asks, do I prefer, that's me, um, smaller cats with the low volume hulls such as the Hobie 14, Hobie 16, or the slightly bigger catamarans with the higher volume hulls like the F-18 or the Tornado? Well, thanks very much for your question, Fernando. Um, what I prefer is definitely related to the amount of wind. Um, I really enjoy sailing both types of catamaran. The 16 or the 14 really, really come into their own when it's windy for me. Um, so if the wind's above about 25 knots, a Hobie 16 with a crew of about 65 to 75 kilograms, and that thing is absolutely ripping. And the small hulls, which are asymmetric, are working really well when you're going that fast on a 16, or for that matter, on a 14. When the wind's a bit lighter, then the more slightly more technical sailing on the F-18 or the Tornado, where we've got the spinnaker on board as well, it, um, it reaches its kind of, the boats with the higher volume hulls reach their kind of peak excitement level in a lot less wind. So for that reason, if it was 18 knots of wind and I could sail a C2 or a Tornado, I would opt for that rather than going for a 16 in those conditions. But I'm a big fan of both types, both styles of boat. So it really does just depend on the wind and also the situation as well, who it is that I'm sailing with. If I'm sailing with somebody less experienced, then they're gonna have a much better time probably on a 16 where there's a lot less going on, it's a lot more simple. 
Whereas if I'm sailing with somebody who's very experienced, they're going to have a great time on the 16, but they might feel that they want a bit more to do. So the F18 is going to win in that situation. Thanks very much for your question. And the final question for today is from Timon. This is a good one, actually. He said he's got a jib on his FX1 and it doesn't always furl properly. So if he's trying to roll the jib using the furler, sometimes it doesn't go all the way in. Now, it depends a little bit on the type of battens that are in the jib. On a catamaran with a rolling jib, if it does have battens, it will just have very short battens on to support the leech of the sail that might be at an angle like this rather than straight to allow the sail to roll. If that is the case, um, if your battens are straight like that, then it will be because those battens aren't actually going to roll. So it will only roll as far as that top batten allows. And if you continue to use that jib, there's actually nothing that you can do um, to make the jib roll any further. And if you tried to roll it further with straight battens like that, you might actually damage the sail. So just be careful there. But if the battens are either diagonally um, inserted, or if you haven't got battens and you're having difficulty rolling the jib, perhaps especially if it's windy, then what that might be is that you've got too much load in the jib when you're trying to roll it. So if you try to roll the jib when you're on an upwind point of sail, it's not gonna roll very nicely. The best time to roll the jib if it's windy is to put the boat onto a dead run. So that is with the wind coming from directly behind you. That's gonna take all of the pressure out of the jib. You're gonna be sailing at approximately the same speed as the wind. So the jib shouldn't flap at all. And then you can roll the sail and it will roll really nicely if you turn your boat very directly downwind. So there we go. So thanks very much for coming along for this um, alternative question and answer session. Thanks for sending in your questions. Uh, usually we will just be answering the questions in the actual session, um, the live session, but I had difficulties with the internet yesterday. So that is why I've had to make this additional video. See you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. Thank you very much.